Hi, Sam. Thanks for joining me, friend. Thanks so much for having me. So I'd really love to uh, dive into your work and learn more about uh, the things that you've been thinking about and doing. Um, but maybe just to start, could you share a bit about yourself personally and who you are and your life background and your story? Sure. Um, I am a PhD student in Oxford, or a default student, as we call it there, where I uh, work on quantum theory, on the foundations of quantum theory, to be specific. And uh, previously, I studied in Amsterdam, where I did my master's and bachelor's degree, uh, also the city depicted in the background. And uh, the reason I studied there is because I'm Dutch. So I grew up in the Netherlands and then spent a period uh, in England. And uh, in both places, I, I was basically primarily interested in quantum theory. And how did you get interested in theoretical physics and quantum theory? That is a good question. I guess it uh, is a subject that kind of fascinated me in high school. And then I think mostly through watching and reading uh, things by Richard Feynman, I like my interest was elevated to the next level where you kind of, uh, you know, there's there was a certain interest I had in, in class where the material that was discussed there was kind of appealing in, in, a, in an old way where most classes were kind of boring physics somehow kind of stuck out. But then through through reading stuff like um, the, uh, I forget the famous name now, it's not something like the principles of, of physics by Feynman. Uh, it's probably not the actual name of the book, but he has a, he has a series of textbooks. Uh, they're the final lectures. There we go. I forgot the name. They're quite famous and they're nice, and they kind of explain physics in a in a way that really makes it uh, understandable. In a way that uh, most textbooks kind of are, are impenetrable, and this this is very yeah lighthearted almost. And you, you feel his enjoyment for the subject, which is which is fun. And uh, then it, it just seemed like a, a natural thing to want to study uh, the. Funnily enough, I was was contemplating studying either physics or art, which which people often find interesting, and and physics won out. It was, it was the more interesting subject. Although well, you still have an art practice, is that right? Uh, like as a hobby? Yeah, I still I still uh, try to draw. I've been drawing more often lately. So I, I started an Instagram account because I thought it'd be fun to kind of keep at it and have a reason to keep drawing. Mm -hmm. And I try to upload there every now and then, although I, I'm not uploading as much as I would like, but it's fun. It's a, it's a nice reason to kind of, yeah, keep engaging with the hobby. Hmm. And what kinds of things do you focus on when you draw or make art? Uh, at the moment, it's, it's, it's portraits. I, I like people's faces. They're kind of interesting. I am, um, yeah, previously it was mainly model drawing. I'm, I'm very bad at at drawing environments, I've noticed. So like things like trees, when I try to drill them, I'm, I'm really bad. I, I, I practice a couple of times and it just always comes out in a way that doesn't really satisfy me again. But then people and faces and things like that are really kind of fascinating. Uh, I can just about manage to do that. Hmm. Uh, so yeah, I, I kind of like, I don't know if you know, do you know Lucian Freud? And, uh, no, I don't he, think so. He, he, he's related to, to Sigmund Freud. I think he's just, grandson or something like that and he predominantly painted and drew uh, faces of portraits and people and almost nothing besides that like he I don't think he has any still lifes or anything like that at, at least not that I'm aware of uh, so things that are very similar to, to what he was interested in is uh, stuff like the stuff that I like to draw as well hmm. He, if you don't know him, he has a very nice way of drawing faces. It's especially his kind of, I think that he has etchings, etchings. And the way he draws people is interesting because they're always kind of, they, they, it looks like they're not really aware that they're being painted. It looks like they're just kind of thinking about something mundane or odd, and they, they have a kind of strange, somewhat confused facial expression. And, and the Drawings and paintings are not really about the, their faces. It's almost like capturing someone in, a, in almost like a, a random moment when they're having a strange thought or something. And, and the, the emphasis is really on like the structure of the face and 
I, I enjoy that kind of stuff. It's it's nice. It's interesting in a weird way. <laughs> mm. Um, I find that interesting because I also love doing faces and portraits, although I have a hard time with it and have gotten better, but I find things like trees and nature to be easier to draw. Uh, and I'm focusing on trees right now and people's faces feel very difficult for me. So that's that's interesting that uh, that's your focus. Nice. Yeah, I think I've seen your trees. I think that they were nice and mm. that they can buy on Instagram as well. Is that right? Yeah, I also started an art Instagram just for fun. So. Uh, and re recently have been doing focusing on trees in particular so uh find that just focusing on one thing for a while you know kind of helps to get better at it so um what made you interested in trees i'm very curious oh trees um i mean a bunch of things but um i think a lot of it has to do with some shifts that i started to experience when i did a lot of meditation and a solitary retreat in Vermont uh, in 2020. And um, at the beginning of that retreat, like I, I've been before that, I would see trees as just like colors or shapes or objects. And then I started to sort of perceive them more directly as like living beings that are really, I experienced them as like my friends and just like beautiful creatures that are everywhere. And um, they're very beautiful to me now. And I see them as, uh, people and beings and friends rather than you know like an object or a material and um they just i mean um i find people beautiful of course but i also find trees just very beautiful in the bark and the leaves and the colors and uh they're they're captivating and um i'd really like my art with trees to sort of express that to um sort of transmit what it's like to experience a tree as a as a person or a being that's worthy of respect and love rather than uh, an object or, you know, a material. Very nice. Yeah, they are beautiful. They, mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the things that both drawing and science strangely have in common is that it, there's a way in which you kind of think you know what an object looks like, like a tree. And then if you, are really confronted with having to draw it you, you realize that the, the thing which you thought was very simple is in fact like extremely sophisticated and has all these nuanced little bits that you've tried to put on paper it becomes really difficult there was a i did an orientation year in, in art school in amsterdam when i was about 16 or so and there was one exercise which kind of stuck with me and it, it was just that people had to draw a bike from memory and almost everyone filled it from the bike. They they all had like the, the various elements in in all places. And if you kind of looked at it long enough, you realize that actually that's that isn't even functional. That couldn't be a bike. And uh, I, I think presumably you experience the same trees and faces. I, I have I have it too. I think everyone has it when they start to draw that you kind of have these misconceptions about what the world looks like, and then you have to be confronted with that in an interesting way. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I think that maybe that's part of why faces are hard for me because it's sort of easier for me to notice those like you know if, if the proportions are just slightly off like we we really notice it's like oh that doesn't look quite yeah. right so yeah 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 and there's also the added weirdness where you have you have an idea about what a face looks like and sometimes being more accurate means explicitly going against what you think you should be drawing yes and that there's some tension there as well which presumably you don't have with drawing things like trees where there's, you don't look at trees as much as you do at faces so you have fewer kind of biases against what you yeah how you think the drawing should turn out um yeah they're all i don't know as i said i think it's it's very similar to science where you have these misconceptions which you only find out about once you really start thinking about what you're doing and uh, it's interesting that drawing has exactly the same issue Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. I, I I imagine that I'll be working through those themes in my art for a long time. It feels very early because um, I really just started drawing like a year ago or so. So, um, yeah. Well, presumably, this is all that art is is, uh, but all that perhaps all thinking is is solving misconceptions. So. so. Presumably, it would be an endless process. Uh -huh. I think it's everyone. That's the fun of it. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no point at which you're good enough. 
that you won't have misconceptions about how the world works, including about how faces and trees and objects look. So you, you can always keep improving in that mm -hmm. specific way. Mm. I like that, the thinking is just all about misconceptions in art and physics are just examples of that. Yeah. Um, coming back to your, your own story, um, what made you, I mean, it seems like you, you sort of encountered physics and, you know, the Feynman lectures and things like this, like what made you decide to focus on that specifically? Uh, like, like, oh, I want to go into this and make it the focus of my work and studies. Yeah, it's difficult to say. I think it's something, it just seemed like one of the deepest subjects that I had ever come across where you have these explanations about how the real world works and they're not in any sense approximate. They're not, they're not claiming to be kind of true. They're, they're supposed to be the laws of the universe. And I found that very intriguing. That seemed just interesting to me that there could be such a thing as laws of the universe and principles by which we can construct theories. These very deep and puzzling ideas about the world, world which, which once you understand them, kind of make more sense than your, your previous world view had them. You, know, you have a common sense understanding of how the world works, just like when, uh, as, as in drawing, you have the, these notions about how, say, a bicycle looks, and, and you want, want to start thinking deeper about it, you realize that there's all kinds of old things about your ideas about how the bike looks, which you then solve with a better theory. And the same is true in science, where you, you find these deeper explanations and you're kind of baffled at how you could have even gone along with the previous explanation because it was so faulty and mistaken that you might have held it very deeply. Uh, and I thought that was interesting too, that the world is just very different from how we think it is. Uh, the world as we think it appears is, is not really the world as uh, science describes it. Science conflicts a lot with common sense. And then that's what I, th I think that was just the most true of physics that it intrigued me the most in that way. And also it was, I, I liked mathematics, which features heavily. So there are other reasons as well, but I think the, the primary reason I was interested in it is just that you, you, you presents a new world, which is not good. Um, so I wonder, I mean, how, I want to ask just a lot of very basic and simple questions about your work. And uh, if I don't understand, I'll just dive deeper. And um, I wonder if you could start by describing, I think I have sort of a, a mental model of what theoretical physics is, but I would be curious how you would describe it in, in sort of contrast to other branches of physics or science. That's a good question, I guess. Theoretical physics, the way, the way I would describe it roughly would be something like there are two main theories of physics at the moment, the fundamental physics, and they are uh, general relativity and quantum theory. And they have a pretty well understood mathematical framework, which we can use to make predictions, but there's also lots of problems that are still unanswered. There's things about not just the things that we can predict, but also the explanations, the underlying explanations, which don't yet quite make sense. And I, I think science is an open-ended process, so we'll, we'll always be in a situation in which our best theories of the world will be will, will contain problems that have to be solved. It's like we're not going to go out of business in science. There's always the next issue to deal with. And theoretical physicists work on these problems in the explanations of the theory. They try to resolve conceptual issues. Uh, whereas if you're an experimentalist, then you'd be interested in trying to refute the theory in some way or trying to find another prediction or test new theories against one another. And, and on the theoretical side, you, you, you have these conceptual issues that you're trying to make sense of, that you're trying to resolve and give an account of why the issue uh, can be solved. And yeah, that is roughly what theoretical physics is all about. It's all about these uh, important conceptual issues that we want solutions to. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, for example, I I never forget whose paradox this is, but there is this paradox in classical physics where you can wonder why is the sky, the night sky, black? Because if the universe is infinitely old, as used to be, as people used to think was the case, then no matter in what direction you would look, there would be a star somewhere in that direction that would have had time to shine light towards the earth. And so there would be no point in the night sky where there wouldn't be a star or some kind of light source shining in our direction. So in fact, we should expect that the whole world should be uh, lit even at night. And, and that's obviously not the case. The night sky is not completely uh, lit up like that. It's, it's mostly black. And so that needs a that needs a theoretical solution. There needs to be some kind of explanation for why the world isn't like it's described in the thought experiment. And that's the to me, that's kind of the heart of theoretical physics, is having those kinds of things which are really mind-boggling, which just don't seem to make sense with the worldview that we have now, or in this case, the worldview that people used to have. And uh, making sense of that, like finding something, some satisfying answer to it and being like, oh my God, that, of course, it has to be that. It, how could it, how could I not realize that, that must have been the solution to the problem? Uh, I mean, the, the solution to this particular problem is partly, I believe, that the universe isn't infinitely old. Stars had to form at some uh, time in the past and haven't had, they haven't had an infinite amount of time to shine light towards the Earth. So the visible universe is expanding. We, we haven't yet seen all of space. And that's just a very interesting shift in your worldview where uh, the difference between a finite universe and, a, and an infinitely old universe, or rather, a universe that's, that's finitely old and a universe that's infinitely old is, uh, is very different. And that turns out to be the solution in this case. And typically, they're, they're similarly like unexpected changes in uh, how we view the world before we can understand those kinds of issues. I, th I think another one is actually um, the, that people were confused about why the sun had so much energy, energy to shine uh, on both the earth and, the, and about the stars, sorry, uh, on both the earth and just into space. Like before we understood quantum theory and nuclear fusion, there wasn't really an explanation for how it could be that the, the sun was emitting so much light and energy. Part, part of the reason they thought this was uh, possible was just gravitational collapse, that the, the sun was kind of collapsing in on itself, and that that would release some gravitational potential energy in the form of light. And I think calculations were done there, it's very clear that that was, was not at all a sufficient explanation, because the sun might have collapsed much sooner than uh, is the case. Uh, wouldn't have been as old as it is if, if it was collapsing in that way. So again, we now take for granted that we have that explanation that at some point in the past, people weren't aware of, of nuclear fusion and they couldn't explain why the sun was emitting light uh, at the rate that it was and they couldn't explain why it was as old as it was. Uh, they also couldn't explain why the sun was emitting the spectrum of light that it's emitting. You also need common theory for that. So. The, Black body radiation problem, which was sort of blank, and people often claim that that's kind of the start of quantum theory. So before that discovery, it wasn't even clear why the sun was emitting in the, uh, the visible range, for example. So yeah, it's it's nice to look back at the history of science and see that all these things that we we now take for granted actually were discovered fairly recently, and that the world made less sense back then. But uh, yeah, the, the problems that these people solved were really fascinating. Like not being able to understand why the sun is shining is a is a really strange problem. There's a very broad and basic question that's coming up for me, which is something like, why would we think that thinking about the universe could help us to understand it better? Like, not not that it shouldn't be that, but uh, what yeah. sort of evidence do we have of that? And yeah. Yeah, well, it's it's, uh, it's interesting that it does, right? Like we, you, uh, there's no how to say it, like a priori reason to think that thinking about the universe can help us understand it, but it's 
thinking about the world is, is extremely effective. I think the, uh, the reason why it is so effective is probably because the world in which we couldn't explain things in the world a, a world in which some parts of the universe were inexplicable is, is that world is itself a very bad explanation like that's supposing that there is something supernatural something which we can't really make sense of and you can always say that that's the case you can always say that some part of the world can't be understood and that that's the solution to the problem uh, but the fact that you can always say it makes it a bad explanation the fact that you can always say well uh, oh well you know this, there's just no explanation for why the sun is shining uh, that, that's the you should just stop thinking about it that is a move you can always make and because of that uh, you're dealing with a bad explanation and uh, we can just do away with bad explanations as a rule of thumb we, we don't have to accept them or rather as a methodological rule we don't have to accept bad explanations so oh. the world in which we can't the world in which we can't make sense of things by thinking about them would be a world in which we would have to accept that bad explanations are are true or good or that we have to deal with them and that's that's not necessary that's uh, we can reject them outright but it's kind of like the belief in the supernatural. It's like if, if you don't believe in the supernatural, then for that same re reason, you can believe that the world is explicable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm curious, historically speaking, what were some of the first things that theoretical physicists in the history of science gave good explanations for that are sort of still uh, valid? Well, the, the first part is interesting because I'm not sure when the idea of being a theoretical physicist came about. It used to be the case that there was a very vague divide between theoretical physics and experimental physics. I mean, Newton did experiments, Galileo did experiments, but they were also theoretical physicists in the sense that they proposed these new theories of physics, uh, like Newton's classical mechanics. and they were, they were a mix of the two. So uh, I, I guess another way of asking the same question would be something like, when did scientists first begin to, to understand the world? And that is, I, I think I'm not enough of a historian to give a, a really exact answer to that. Some people, uh, Popper has a claim somewhere in, I think it's his book, Conjectures and Reputations, where he says that a student of Zeno was the first to really discover how the world works, or I'm not sorry, not how the world works, how um, to really implement the scientific method, the method of being critical of one's teacher and trying to uh, replace the theories that one is, is taught. The theory in question, I think, was that the world, his, I, I forget the names of all, all, all the people involved in this particular bit of the history of science, but. There was some teacher who thought that the world was drifting on uh, the foundation of water. So it's like we have the earth and the earth is, is uh, suspended in water. And one of the students said, well, that gives rise to an infinite regress. And a better explanation would be to say that the world is just suspended in nothing. It doesn't have to be supported by anything. It's kind of like a drum. And one side of the drum is our earth is what we see. And then there's another side of the drum, which is perhaps another earth or something like that. But because it's it's suspended in nothing, it doesn't have to be suspended uh, by water, things like that, which solves the problem of the infant regress in the initial theory. And uh, I'm not sure if Popper is right on that. I, again, I'm not enough of a historian of, of science, but it's an interesting claim to say that that was the first instance of someone improving on a theory. Uh, the pre-Socratics in general were pretty interesting. They, uh, Parmenides had, for example, an insight into the nature of the moon, which I, I still think is quite nice. He, at the time, it was believed by uh, his contemporary Heraclitus that the moon was like a ball of fire that was rotating, and that that would explain why the moon was waxing and waning. Uh, 
So it's like sometimes the ball is like facing away from us, and sometimes it's facing towards us, which is would explain why the, the moon is sometimes lit up from particular angles. And Parmenides realized that that is not the case, that the moon is in fact just a, a spherical object, which is lit by the sun uh, from different angles throughout the month. And that uh, the moon itself is not really changing, it's more that the sun is just shining on it differently. So uh, based on that, he actually had a very interesting theory of, of change. And he, he, he then have generalized this discovery to say that uh, just like the moon isn't really changing, that nothing in the world uh, changes whatsoever. It's just that we, we with our with our minds, with our, uh, or rather we with our sensory kind of organs think that the world is changing, but through reason we can find out that everything is in fact completely static. Uh, just like the moon is not really changing, it just seems to be changing because it's uh, it's lit up from by the sun from different angles. Uh, so anyway, but it's a nice, it, at the very least, it's a nice discovery that he he realized that the moon is this spherical object in the sky when, yeah, uh, orbiting the earth. Hmm. Yeah, I think part of what I'm chewing on is like, I imagine that it only became possible to reason about certain things that you work on in the last century or so. And that, uh, you know, when philosophers and scientists were first starting to do their work that, uh, you know, they could probably reason about things like fire or water or like where life comes from or um, the stars and the planets and things like that. Uh, and like what kinds of things they can have findings about. You mean, sorry, go ahead. No, please, please. Uh, you mean that the kind of things that we know about now were only really discoverable in the last century or so? I imagine that... that to be the case, and then that other things were more that you could just reason about more directly, uh, that were more immediate or in in the sky or things like that. Yeah, I think it's a, it's always a mix. It's always like the, the interesting thing about pre-Socratics is that they with just reasoning about the world, they came very far. For example, uh, atomism it stems from the pre-Socratics, and they had no way whatsoever of knowing that the world was, well, knowing through experimental observations that the world was made of atoms. So uh, it's, it's interesting to see that, although a lot of discoveries have been made in the last two, 300 years because of the scientific revolution, there, the experiments were not, you know, purely necessary to reach some of the same conclusions we've reached today, like atomism or not. Uh, you, you don't necessarily need to have experimental data to be an atomist, which which I think just think is a nice philosophical point. Um, Do you have a sense of what things they were reasoning about that led them to being able to? think in terms of atomism? Also a good question. I I think they were uh, thinking about the differences between discrete entities and the continuous, which is in some sense the, the conflict that has played out in, in quantum theory as well, where the quantum theory, as the name implies, is about well, in, in quantum theory, discrete entities have a much more fundamental status, whereas in classical mechanics, uh, the continuum is, is very fundamental. So, for example, if you have a, a moon orbiting a planet, then you could shift that orbit by an arbitrary amount. And it would, like, you can ask the question, is that still the same orbit? It's, it's been shifted by uh, you know, an, an arbitrarily small deviation. From its initial path and nothing in classical physics says that that's not how different is that from the initial order you can you can kind of shift things continuously into one another and in quantum theory there are uh, yeah you you can very clearly say for example oh something is now in a new uh, atomic orbit as i would call it if, it, if there's only specific orbitals that electrons can be in, they can't be anywhere in between 
these orbits or orbitals. Um, but anyway, so the I think the crisis was kind of thinking about similar issues where he was wondering, uh, if I remember correctly, like how finely can you cut something? Like if you can cut materials, then uh, and and they're all made of continuous stuff. They're not made of little lumps of things which are not divisible, but they're made of something which is continuous and continuously divisible. Then uh, something like if you if you cut it one way and then if you cut it very slightly, infinitesimally slightly to the right and cut it again, to what extent is that the same cut is uh, again I, I'm having somewhat of a hard time exactly remembering this, but it, yeah, he was motivated by the problems that are inherent in considering a world that consists of uh, matter that we can is continuously divisible and doesn't itself consist of things which are uh, indivisible, which he, he then said, well, all these problems with the continuum can be solved by just supposing that there's these indivisible lumps that the world consists of, the world consists of, as he put it, the void and uh, the atoms. Uh, also, the, they were interested in the problem of change. So they were interested in what does it mean for something to become different without losing its identity. So things when things evolve, they there is a sense in which, for example, the uh, the table that my computer is resting on is changing over time. But it, there is a sense in which it is still the same table. And the uh, part of the solution that Democritus gave was that if we have these indivisible lumps, which are, uh, they are fundamental in the sense that they, they are, that they retain their identity. They're just lumps organized at different points in space. And the only thing you can change about them is that they are at different points in space, but other attributes of them are not changeable. Then, uh, you can start to make sense of why things retain their identity over time. It's just that they are particular organizations of, of these atoms. Um, the problem of change was a problem that a lot of the pre-Socratics were interested in. Yeah, I feel a lot of admiration for those thinkers because I imagine if I was in their shoes, like I would be just as curious about where the world came from and what the world is and why we're alive. And uh, I, I remember reading Aristotle in school and like reading him describe uh, like anatomy and how the body works. And like, you know, some of his conclusions were things that we no longer think are true, but some of them were like quite accurate. and. I realized that yeah he didn't say this explicitly but that he had probably uh done like dissections and you know mm -hmm. like dissected humans probably and animals and been like what is going on here and like how does this work and why is this body dead now that you know what changed such that it's alive and dead and I don't know that I would have even thought to do a dissection you know I mean it's sort of a counterfactual but it's sort of similar with physics of like I don't know if I was looking at the night sky and was like, I don't know anything about this or like looking at, uh, you know, objects moving or things like that. I'd be like, I want to know how this works and I don't, I don't know where to start. So um, it's uh, just kind of interesting to think about the roots and origins of this whole line of thinking. Um, yeah, it also feels whenever I read about the history of science, you kind of I feel very sympathetic and to to these thinkers and the solutions they came up with because it's somehow strangely timeless like they were they lived in a world very different from our own and yet the brilliance of their solutions when viewed in the right light when you really understand their problem situation is is amazing like the uh, just thinking about the fact that the came up with the atomic theory is is really fascinating uh, especially because in some sense it's you know the, the essence of this theory is true that atomism has turned out to be hugely successful and that it, it, the world does actually contain atoms. And yeah, that's it. There's something very uh, 
I'm not quite sure what the right word is, something like endearing about it, that you can reach, yeah, that their solutions had so much truth in them and that they were, uh, they got so far with the tools available to them at the time. Definitely, definitely. I imagine history will be, I, I would imagine and hope that history will be as kind to you and your colleagues when, you know, fast forward, there's other future explanations and things like that. Yeah, well, hopefully it's all of us. It's, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we're all trying to make sense of the world. Um, and yeah, there is something kind of timeless about the attempt to do that, even if you fail, even if one fails to really understand the world better, like just the attempt itself is, uh, has something beautiful to it. Mm, definitely. Can you describe uh, in as simple terms as possible, uh, reasonably simple terms, the sort of relationship between general relativity and quantum theory and what those are? I wish I could say so the general relativity and quantum theory are the two main pillars of modern physics. And one of the main problems in modern physics is that they, we don't know how to unite them. We, we know that, for example, matter is perfectly well described by quantum theory. Right? Like all our explanations of, of, of matter are really quantum mechanical in nature. Um, I used to work in a subject called condensed matter physics, which uh, roughly speaking, is about things like uh, like metals, like magnets, but also in, in a more general sense, the, the objects that we see around us, like tables and pens and things like that, and the properties that they have are all described by condensed matter physics. And condensed matter physics is uh, basically completely quantum mechanical. Like there's, there's no theory in condensed matter theory that's at all fundamental, which is, is not a quantum theory, and. Uh, on the other hand, we have we have space time, and space time is this thing which, according to general relativity, can curve, can bend, and it has to do so partly because of the presence of matter. And uh, some of the conflict arises from the fact that matter is described by quantum theory that that space time itself is classical, and that we don't know how those systems would interact with one another. Uh, there's, there's no way, there's no description that we have of space time which is quantum mechanical which we would need to unify the, the two theories. And that has been an open problem for a very long time, at least 50, 60 years or so, if not longer. And uh, I, yeah, so I, I wish you could give a more detailed explanation of, of how, they, how the two theories connect with one another, but then I'd probably have a noble price. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, but it, it, it's a, that's one of the main open problems in modern physics. And what does it mean to be focusing on quantum theory? What is quantum theory? Yeah, so quantum theory is, I think the way I view it is as a set of, set of principles which other theories of physics have to obey. It's, quantum theory isn't really a theory of physics in the same way that, say, electromagnetism is a theory of physics. Electromagnetism is a theory about a very specific physical entity, namely the electromagnetic field. And it describes in detail how that field behaves in the presence of charges and things like that. And the theory is just the theory of these objects, of these physical systems, whereas quantum theory is in some sense much more general. It isn't about any particular physical system. It isn't, for example, just a theory of atoms, uh, but there is a quantum theory of the atom. And there is a quantum theory of for example, uh, metals, there's a quantum theory of ferromagnetism, there's a quantum theory of, of all kinds of various aspects of the world. And so I, I think quantum theory is more like a set of principles that other theories of physics have to obey. So if you have some theory about how the world works, then one criticism that you could have of it is, well, does it satisfy the principles of quantum theory? Yeah, so there's a set of principles which, according to quantum theory, all other theories of physics should obey by, should by. And uh, explicitly stating the principles would maybe be a bit too technical, but it's something like that the, the objects that are described by a quantum theory have 
the, the possibility of being in what are called superpositions. And uh, roughly the way that I, I would describe that is that the object can have other instances. It can have, if, the, if, it's also, if it's possible for an object to be in one state and in another state, then it's also possible for the object to be in both of those states at the same time. So there will be two instances of the object both existing simultaneously uh, if, if it can be in either one of those states. And uh, it can become entangled, which is something which I can maybe elaborate on a bit later, but um, those are the main kind of attributes of, of quantum systems is that they, uh, the states of such systems can be in superpositions and they can get entangled with other uh, quantum systems. So just to connect it a bit more to the many worlds interpretations I think we talked about previously and you seemed interested in, is also basically at the heart of, of my work. I, I'm interested in the interpretation as well. So according to that interpretation, these other instances of a physical object uh, really exist at the same time. So if you have, for example, a photon uh, that is traveling along uh, one, one of two paths, so you have a, a uh, like a laser beam emitting a photon that can travel this way or can travel that way. Then there's also a state of the system where the photon is traveling both of those directions at the same time, and those really exist simultaneously with one another. And, and the same is true for basically everything that we see around us. Everything that we see around us has the possibility of being in these so-called superpositions where they are in more than one state at the same time. They have they have other instances which are very slightly different from the instances that we see. And similarly, uh, we ourselves also have other instances in what are sometimes called other universes, other Everettian universes, after its creator Everett. And yeah, that that kind of gets at the heart of what quantum theory is about. It's about these systems which can have other instances and which can also they have additional attributes like they can interfere with one another. So if you have a photon that's traveling along one of these two paths, you can have these mirrors that deflect, that deflect them again, and then they come together and they interfere such that, for example, all the, the right-going photons get eliminated and only the upwards going ones remain. So there's a sense in which these other instances can affect each other. The same is true of, do you know the double slit experiment where they they have these two slits and they fire photons at it. And then behind the screen, you can see this interference pattern where a certain spots on the screen behind the double slits get uh, a photon, get hit by a photon, and another other spots get hit by a photon that less frequently. And that's because the other instances are kind of eliminating each other or negatively, dis destructively interfering with one another. So that uh, they don't hit those parts of the screen. And again, the, the heart of the explanation is that there are really these other instances which are influencing the things that we uh, observe. They, we, we can infer from, from theory and experiment that those other instances must, must really be there. Um, I'd love to talk at some length about the many worlds interpretation, but I just want to back up and can you say more about what entanglement is? So entanglement uh, occurs when two quantum systems interact with one another. And the way to think about it is that if, if you have things which can be in these, for example, these two states that you have a photon going in two directions at the same time, then if you interact with the photon, then what do you end up interacting with? Because there's, there's not just one instance of the photon, there's two of them. And when one system becomes entangled with another system, it's kind of like they saw one of the two instances. So if you have uh, another, maybe you have, well, we would just, for example, you have a, an atom or something that's in the way of the photon and then gets hit by it. Well, then it, you know, the atom might be on this trajectory. The photon is in a superposition of going this way and that way. If it, if it goes this way, then it hits the atom. If it goes that way, then it doesn't hit the atom. Then the atom ends up being entangled in the sense that uh, one version of the atom got hit by a photon and the other one uh, did not get hit. So in one universe, uh, the atom interacted with the photon because in that universe, the photon traveled this way 
And in another universe, the photon traveled upwards and, and the atom was never hit. So the atom then also has another instance. It's, um, it's about the way that quantum systems interact with one another such that you take into account that there's these other instances of physical objects that can exist at the same time. I, I don't know if that makes it clear. I can try to explain it better if that wasn't. No, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm also curious, um, coming back to the double slit experiment, can you tell me a little bit about sort of the historical context of what was happening such that that experiment happened and like, wh what was preceding it and so on? It's a, yeah, it's a good question. I think it started with uh, experiments that were done on light to determine whether light was or wasn't a, a wave. And that must have been Thomas Young who did that. He, he had an experiment to show that light was a wave because it interfered with itself in, uh, in this particular way that the double slit showed. And that settled the debate that was quite old. I think that must have started with Newton, who had a theory that light was made of, I think he called them corpuscles or something. And I'm probably mispronouncing that. Uh, but little bits of matter, little bits of light that uh, were supposedly what the rays of light consisted of, according to, to Newton. Now, that his particular theory. I don't know much about it. I've heard it said that it's not, it's it's actually not that much like quantum theory. It's, it's a pretty different idea. And it, it, it was kind of unsophisticated, but I, I'm not really capable of making any claims about it other than that. That's what I've heard people say about it. Um, so people were trying to settle this issue of whether or not light was a, a wave or a particle. The double slit experiment pretty conclusively at the time showed that light was a wave. And then as far as I remember, people began to think about, for example, putting uh, electrons through the, this kind of a uh, double slit experiment, and they found that the electrons apparently behaved just like light did. I assume that sometime before that, there was also the photoelectric effect, which is um, this weird thing where if you uh, trying to excite a, I guess it's some, yeah, if you, if you try to excite some electrons in a, in a metal with light, then uh, it, it turns out that if you keep the frequency of light the same, but just higher the intensity, so just, you're basically emitting more light in the hopes of uh, exciting electrons in a piece of metal, then you're not necessarily exciting more electrons. It's only when you increase the frequency that you'll, you'll excite more electrons, which is not really the, how the classical theory of light as a wave would explain what's happening to the electrons in the, in the metal. If, you, if light was a wave, then having more frequency, then having a higher intensity would, would make sure that more electrons get excited. Uh, and somehow that's not what happens. So the, well, the explanation is that light consists of photons and that their energy is proportional to the frequency of the light. And so only if the light has a high enough frequency can it actually uh, get some of these electrons excited. Anyway, this is a whole, and this is maybe slightly too technical, but that was one of the discoveries that Einstein helped explain. I think that was actually the thing he got the Nobel Prize for, uh, because I think they didn't want to give him the Nobel Prize for general relativity, <laughs> but they wanted to give him the Nobel Prize for something. Um, so all these uh, things were roughly happening at the same time and quantum theory managed to solve all of them. But, and of course, as I said earlier on, there was the, uh, the black hole radiation, sorry, the black body radiation problem, which was solved by Planck, which was the question of why to uh, how can we explain the spectrum of bodies that are heated up? Anyway. Mm, helpful. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. I kind of forget what the question was you asked. Oh, I was just trying to get a sense of the sort of historical context mm. that led to these uh, experiments. And um, yeah, I'm 
one of the real questions at the heart of this conversation for me is wanting to know about what the sort of, I guess you'd say like epistemic status of the many worlds interpretation of quantum theory is. And like, are there, is that like, are, are there multiple universes or not? And uh, I think maybe to get into that, I'd be curious to ask, like you say it's like, like the phrase is the many worlds interpretation. Are there other interpretations and how do they uh, like? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, well, first of all, I think that the label interpretations is a bit misleading. It, it's probably, they should really be called the different quantum theories because they're all slightly different theories of uh, that, that are variants of quantum theory. And the many worlds interpretation is the most conservative one. It's the one that basically says if we just take quantum theory seriously, the formalism as it is, and it's like minimal form seriously and apply that to everything, then we can have a coherent picture of how the world works. There's other explanations of quantum theory and they all end up, well, other variants of quantum theory, and they all end up adding something to the formalism. They all end up having additional axioms that, for example, should explain why measurements happen the way they do. And in all those theories, there, there's a sense in which there's only a single world but it's not really clear why it's there other than that it's really been put in by fiat. You kind of, and in a somewhat ad hoc way, you add that there, there is only one world that really exists. And uh, yeah, there are other theories. Uh, many worlds is not the most, uh, well, the, I think the many worlds interpretation is still a minority view among physicists, although it's grown. And the main contender views are something like collapse theory, which is an explanation that says that once you observe a, a quantum system to be in one state rather than, a, than another, so one, if a quantum system is in a superposition of, for example, these photons being here and there, then collapse says, if you observe the photon being on this trajectory, the, the other possibility of the photon also going upwards just disappears, it, it gets erased through some kind of mechanism that's called collapse. And as the many worlds do, that, that seems very strange because you have to add this rule that certain physical states, which before you measure the system, appear to be there, just have to be deleted. They have to, uh, they, they have to disappear through some kind of probabilistic process where this one gets chosen instead of this one. Whereas in the many worlds interpretation, there is an account of what happens to the other instance of the photon is just that in another universe you observe that other instance and that's that's perfectly compatible with quantum theory because you and other people and measuring instruments in general are quantum systems and they have this ability to uh, also have other instances so there's just another instance of you observing the other instance of the photon and that is in some sense stranger than collapse theory because it feels like it's counterintuitive that there should be other versions of you which you don't feel exist. They can't see them directly. And they're just, we can infer that they exist from theory, but we can't see them directly. But it's less strange in the sense that we don't have to have these the weird rules that we have to add onto the formalism. So it's, it's more bare bones and cleaner and more elegant. And uh, it also just actually gives an account of what's going on in the world rather than saying, well, there's, there's some rule that we invented to make sense of what we see, but which doesn't really make sense in its own right. What, what is causing the many worlds interpretation to be the minority and other views like collapse theory to be the majority? Uh, mainly historical reasons. Collapse theory, well, I think there's just been a lot of confusion on this topic. As Bryce DeWitt used to say, that the quality of the debate drops to zero once the many worlds interpretation gets mentioned. I think partly it must be that people assume the world, that there aren't other universes, that there aren't worlds in which you have counterparts that live lives which, once you've branched, can go on to exist independently of you. And that's just too much like science fiction to be actually to be to be true. So yeah, I, I think the main reason why people assume that uh, the many worlds interpretation isn't true is because it's counterintuitive. But also, 
there, there are problems at the heart of, of the physics community where maybe these philosophical issues are kind of brushed aside. They're not taken too seriously and they're not given much thought. Uh, there's an assumption that we uh, maybe we just can't know what the solution to these problems is. Maybe uh, we just, people just copy what they heard and they think that the problem has been solved and that the unintuitive thing is not that there are other universes, but that's just that there's this, this somewhat strange looking rule which tells us how uh, the world looks when we make a measurement. And, and I think this is now somewhat changing. There's various people who are gaining notoriety in the field, like David Wallace and Sean Carroll, David George has been uh, working on this for a while, and this is quite well known as well. And they, yeah, all, they've all been advancing the many rules interpretation. So I, I think it's now more popular than it has been, mm -hmm. and people are making progress in the field as well. So uh, I hope that there will at some point be not just a sense in which you know, maybe the many rules interpretation rule will not become more popular, but at least that people think that this is an important issue to work on and that there is something interesting to to discover here, rather than just assuming that these kinds of philosophical issues don't really matter. I guess that the other part of it is people are instrumentalists. They, they're happy as long as they can make the right kinds of predictions. As long as the, the theory allows them to make predictions about the real world, they're satisfied. and to the extent it does that you don't need to think about these conceptual issues that's kind of the prevailing conception at the moment hmm. so that's the status of the field at large i'm curious how you hold this view and is it do you think that there are multiple universes or is this just a plausible explanation or uh what do you think yeah well i would say that we are as certain that there's other universes as, as we were that there were dinosaurs. Like the- that there were what? That there were dinosaurs. Uh -huh. like the, uh, this, this is a, a bit from a book by David Wallace. It's kind of like an introductory book on the topic of many, the many worlds interpretation. He, he has this nice bit where he says, well, you know, no one would say of fossils that they, that, uh, or rather, no one would say of dinosaurs that they're just a way of explaining the existence of fossils. Like dinosaurs actually existed. They were actually there. They were few huge animals roaming the lands. And we know that they existed from partly from theory. We have a theory that explains why these fossils ended up there. And it is that dinosaurs really uh, existed at some point in time. And similarly, we can't see the other universes, but Quantum theory taken seriously that says that they are there, that we, that our world as we experience it isn't any different from these other universes that exist simultaneously with ours. In the, in the formalism of quantum theory, they're all treated exactly equally. Uh, the, there's no little label that says, well, you are here right now. This is where your conscious experience is taking place. This, there's other versions of you which are equally conscious, which have equally real life that so you just can't see. Uh, and this is this is what quantum theory says. And how should we reason about those other universes? Uh, I think what you mean is how should we feel about these other people existing or uh, or do you mean something more specific? Well, I guess two question two specific questions come to mind is like, how many are there? Are there infinity or are there limited amounts? And then also, I guess, I guess the the other big question for me would be like, what is the causal relationship between worlds? Are they totally isolated? Do they have causal impacts mm -hmm. on each other? I, I, and almost a question of like, uh, this is such a s simplistic way of simplistic thing, but like, what's ho what holds all of these universes? Right. Yeah, yeah. So generally speaking. The universes don't interact with one another. They, they've branched off from uh, what is initially you know, one system. So you know, there's, there's a version of me, and then I observe a photon being in the superposition of this one of one of two trajectories. And then I, I branch into two instances, one of which saw the photon traveling up, and the other one traveling seeing the travel to the right. And typically, from then on. 
I, I will be a completely separate entity from that other version of me. The other Sam then goes on to live his life. Uh, and he will not be aware that I exist, nor will I be aware that he exists, other than, again, we can infer the theory that there's no physical effect that we can have on one another uh, from then on because of the way the interactions work in the, in the quantum, in quantum theory. It's, it's, um, it's very difficult for things to, uh, as they say, interfere with one another. So when the photon travels along these two branches, gets affected by the mirror, and then they end up here to interact with one another and to, for example, interfere in such a way that only the awkward going ones still exist and all the ones that go to the right just get extinguished. That, that, that's the so-called interference effect. And that happens, uh, that, that can happen, and it typically happens when systems are not interacting with one another. So they have to be kind of left alone in a certain sense. If they're, if there's, uh, if they're constantly interacting with other atoms or, or uh, other physical systems, then th this, this interference effect can't take place. And that's the only way in which the instances can interact with one another. So for interference, it takes place, and for the the other instances to kind of be aware that they're uh, that there was a they had a double ganger or something like that, they would have to be in a very isolated situation that is in some sense kind of fragile because the world is constantly everything in the world is constantly interacting with everything else in the world. Like light is now hitting me. It's many tens of tens to the twenty fourth or something. And, uh, photons hitting me every second. Uh, in order for me to like interfere with the, an, another Sam in another universe, I would have to make sure that those those kinds of photons are not hitting me. I would have to isolate myself from all these interactions with an environment. And it's because that's very difficult that I I would basically never succeed in interfering with an, another uh, a, a me in another universe. It could happen in principle. And to some extent, this is what quantum computers are about. So quantum computers are systems that are very isolated from their environments, which can uh, interfere in basically any way that we want them to. So these systems are, they have to be very cold, for example, and uh, the operations that they perform are controlled in a very secure way. And we make sure that they, like, they're not being interacted uh, with in an arbitrary way by the environment and and then we can do uh, yeah these these very securely performed interference experiments in in the quantum computer and uh, if you had a mind running on such a computer then it could infer that there were other versions of itself because uh, it, it could to be Give a very hand waving argument. It, it could feel that there is another version of itself because it can perform an interference experiments on itself. But because we don't have such a computer yet, and because we are constantly interacting with everything around us, it, that's very difficult. We we will basically not be able to do uh, experiments like that unless we are able to build a quantum computer. And how about that third question? That uh, like what holds all of these different universes or? Mm -hmm connects them or like what yeah what is yeah yeah that's, that's an interesting question yeah it's uh one very technical answer would be well they're uh they're just all contained in the Hilbert space maybe different maybe to say that less technically it would be like to, to, to phrase the same question just with the classical universe that we we used to think we lived in like what is containing that universe what's containing this one universe is not contained in space because space is part of the universe. So what what are what is it containing? And uh, in the same way, all these other universes are uh, just part of what we call the multiverse. So classically, classically, we used to think that the whole world, which again, it, it's difficult to say what the whole world is contained in. The whole world was called the universe, and that everything physical was part of that universe. And in quantum theory, uh, the whole of the universe is just larger than we thought it was classically. And the thing which is everything in existence is the multiverse. Um, and 
yeah, it's, it's difficult to say where where they are contained. They are contained in other branches of the multiverse, which are just there by uh, assumption. Hmm. And just as, as the classical universe is just there by assumption. And um, would you say that there are infinite different universes? Or oh, yeah, that's the other question. Um, so there's not infinitely many of them. There is some very large number of them I won't say the calculation with, with light, as I said before, it's like uh, light from a lamp and there's roughly something of the order of two to the 24 photons that a, a lamp light emits. And every time they hit me, every, every time one of those photons hits me, I branch because the photons kind of deflect in, in two different ways. So I will do branch for day defected left and there's a branch for the defective another way. So roughly speaking, every time they hit me, I, I branch into uh, two versions of myself. And that happens 10 to the 24 or something times per second. And that's just from light. So there have to be a lot of them. There have to be many, many such universes. And well, why would you say that there's not infinite? Why is it uh, finite? Yeah, because there just every time something branches it, it only branches into uh, a finite number of, of different uh, universes mm. because there is, there's not infinitely many branching events happening at any time uh, there will be finally many also another reason is um, that there are certain bounds that we know of that limit how many universes there can be so in uh, black hole thermodynamics, as it's called, there is this so this thing called the Bekenstein bound, which is a limit on how much information you can store in a finite region of space. And the Bekenstein bound effectively puts a limit on how many different universes there can be. So there's a, a pretty fundamental reason to suppose that there are only a finite number of them rather than infinitely many because mm -hmm. of this thing called the Bekenstein bound. But there are, there are many, many of them, even the Bekenstein bound, although it is a finite number, is unbelievably large. Yeah. There yeah. Unbelievably many of them. And you, you use the word branching several times, which I, I guess mm -hmm. is, I, I'm hearing as sort of a spatial metaphor for how these universes relate to each other. Can you, um, you know, it's sort of intuitive, but can you be a little bit more uh, explicit and talk about uh, what that metaphor means or any other kind of like ways that we can reason about these different universes? Yes. So the term branching kind of alludes to, you know, for example, how a tree has a common stem and then they, if the, uh, <laughs> I mind, the different branches of the tree. Uh, so that is roughly the same structure as the, the multiverse has. So you, you have a, if you go back into the past, then there is a, you have a common history with all kinds of other versions of you, and then so-called branching events happen that make you split, that would make you, well, I, I don't like the term splitting, because it's, it's, it's not really what's going on, but they make you uh, slightly different from one another, and then they, you know, they slowly get turned into these, these things that you might call branches, which then go on to exist independently of one another. They don't recombine, uh, and just like branches on a tree don't recombine. And yeah, that's that's roughly the metaphor that you have. These sometimes people also, also call them histories. These these things which. If you go back far enough, then they they, they kind of join. They're joined somewhere in time. They have the same history at some point in time, and then some event occurred, some quantum interaction occurred, which made them slightly different from one another, and they go on to be independently. Uh, they go on to evolve independently from there on out. So, I, I hope that clarifies it a bit. It does. <laughs> I, I'm going to ask a very similar question, but from a different angle. I mean. If I said something like, uh, how to put this? If I said something like, 
there is a universe in which we didn't have this conversation today, mm -hmm. or we rescheduled it for a different day, or there's a universe in which I asked my questions in a slightly different order or something like that, or where I used a different word in our conversation or something like that. Is it true that such universes exist as you understand it, or is that too high level? Yeah, no, I think that's that's absolutely correct, that there will be other universes in which our lives are slightly different. Like maybe, you know, in a very extreme example would be something like a comet hit the Earth, just because things are very slightly different in that universe, but they surmounted and having the cascading effects that then caused the comet to hit the Earth, and therefore we didn't have this conversation. Uh, there will also be universes in which uh, the dinosaurs didn't die out because the, the the uh, comet that hit the Earth in that case slightly deviated from its trajectory and, and never had the uh, horrific impact that it did, and therefore we never came into existence because the Earth had a radically different history, just because of very initially very minor differences in those universes. And yeah, so it's fair to say that this, this, these other universes can be extremely different from our own just because of small effects, which then having to, on a longer time scale, have radically huge effects. Hmm. Hmm. It's really hard for me to wrap my head around why that wouldn't be an infinite number of multiverses or, or something like every possible universe exists or something like that. Yeah. So the, the, I recently had a Twitter there was an exchange on Twitter about exactly this topic of what it means for everything possible to happen. So that, that's already a can of worms in and of itself in the, the many worlds interpretation, because in some sense, everything that can happen does happen. But then uh, in classical physics, everything that can happen also does happen. But it just describes a single world. Uh, the, the, in classical physics, everything that can happen is just everything that will happen according to the initial conditions of the universe and the equations of motion. And in quantum theory, the same is true, uh, except that the, the things that happen according to the initial conditions and the equations of motion also include these other universes. So anyway, that's, the, uh, that's a difficult issue. But yeah, why, why, why there are not infinitely many other universes? Well, I guess, to high approximation, you could you could suppose that there are just very very many of them, um, but again these these things that you call like branching events, uh, that they only there only a finite number of them happen at any point in time. Right. So right. Uh, it, it, you you get split into you get branched into two or three or four or five instances or something like that, or maybe twenty or a hundred, but you uh, but you never branch into infinitely many versions of yourself and uh, consequently yeah you, you won't be able to branch into uh, infinitely many versions it's always just a finite number of them also they're kind of what we call universes are kind of ill-defined like it, we don't you, you don't really put them into the formalism of quantum theory they just happen to emerge from quantum theory due to the way that systems interact with one another and, and so it's kind of like, uh, I think David Wallace has this analogy of counting clouds. Like there is a sense in which you can say there's a certain number of clouds in the sky, but it gets pretty fuzzy pretty quickly because clouds are this emergent thing. There's not, there's not such a, a thing as what fundamentally counts as a cloud. And, and the universes are, are very similar where they do exist. It's, it's, uh, to a high approximation, you can say that there's other universes, but what does and does not count as a universe is a bit fuzzy just because they're not fundamental entities in theory, they just kind of emerge from it. Yes, that makes sense. That makes sense. And I guess, I guess, sort of practically speaking, it's uh, for just like re one's own reasoning, like there's not actually, a, mathematically there is, but, but intuitively there's not much difference between like very large finite number and infinite. It's like very large. Either yeah, way. yeah. It's, it's a, like a huge number of them either way. And, yes. Uh, it's, I, I bet in certain situations you can get it by way of saying there's infinitely many of them. Fundamentally, there, there can't be, 
because of the Bekenstein bound and these other considerations. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm willing to bet that for most certain, like for most practical circumstances, you can almost say there's infinite infinite. I see. Uh, just I because see. the number is so large that uh, you, you could, like it will cause issues. If you think about it hard enough, I'm sure that that, like that, uh, you won't actually get away with it, but you, you can approximately get away with saying that that's the case. There's an enormous number of universes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> There's a mind-boggling number of them. Yeah. And, and a mind-boggling number of them come into existence every second. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And, and yeah, they have, so you have a lot of counterparts in other worlds, and they live, most of them will live lives pretty similar to yours. Some of them will live lives radically different from yours. And it raises interesting questions about the self and identity and like who you are, if you're really not just this one version of you, but you, you extend, you have many versions of yourself across the multiverse. So uh, it, it raises a lot of interesting philosophical issues as well. Yes, yes. I, I mean, what, the, one of the ones that comes up to begin with is something like, I mean, I imagine from the way you describe it, that in collapse theory, like this universe is sort of privileged. Uh, that's like, this is mm -hmm. the universe. And I, yeah. uh, is there... In this way of seeing things, is there anything special about this universe that we find ourselves in, or it's just like one of many universes that's out there, and there's nothing particularly special about this one that you and I are in? Uh, you mean in the many worlds interpretation? Is, yes, is in there... the many worlds interpretation. Yes. Yeah, in the many worlds interpretation, there's nothing special about our universe. It's just that you and I happen to have a particular perspective on the world, which is that we live in this universe. The quantum theory says that we have counterparts which feel exactly the same they are now having exactly this conversation saying so do you think there's anything special about this universe and and the answer will be well you know there's also the other the other people in the universe that are you know the similar history with and they're asking the same questions so they're, they're not special yes yes that makes sense uh what do you see as some of the sort of um philosophical or ethical even spiritual implications of the many worlds interpretation of quantum theory? I, th I think it doesn't have many ethical implications other than I think Deutsch at some point remarked during a talk that the only ethical implication of the many worlds interpretation being true is that you should advocate for the, the theory. Uh, there's, there's nothing other than that it doesn't really influence ethics. Uh, and I, I pretty much agree with that, that ethically my behavior doesn't really change because there's other versions of me i think well it it's mainly just that it's fascinating that this is how the world is it, it's completely counterintuitive sam harris at some point said that the multiverse is the most bizarre scientific theory which is still credible and I think that's a nice way of describing it. I think I'm probably paraphrasing him. He said something very similar to that. But I like that way of thinking about it, that it's a very bizarre worldview in some sense, but it's it's true. And I, I, I think it has, as I said, interesting implications for uh, not ethics, but for personality, what, what uh, identity means and also things like what knowledge is are all those things are kind of sharpened in the many worlds interpretation so um, if you if you think about how for example the other versions of you would behave in the other universes then if they're creating knowledge they're living lives that are probably pretty similar to yours. So my, maybe my standard example is if you break your arm today in some in one universe, but not in another, then in the universes in which you break your arm, you go to the doctor and they try to patch you up. And if that's successful, then probably, you know, you have a broken arm that gets that's healed in a week or two and maybe a bit longer. And from then on, you are back to how you were before. You, you make a full recovery then you live life as normal again. And the versions of you that broke your arm and the versions of you that didn't break your arm 
then still have roughly the same light, even though there was a very dramatic event that made them different at some point. So like you will still like the same kinds of movies, you'll still be interested in the same kind of topics. And in one universe, you have to spend some time uh, recovering and in another, in another universe you didn't, but that's still very roughly similar to one another because of the fact that we have knowledge about how to deal with uh, broken bones. And that is a more general thing where every, every time we have some knowledge about the world, every time we have solved some problems, we can make the, the branches more similar. We can correct the errors that happen in the other branches so that we uh, live roughly similar lives. Like how uh, other other example would be how animals have knowledge about their environment, which means that if they are being chased by a predator in one universe and they're not being chased by a predator in the other, then the if if they have enough knowledge about how to outrun or uh, prevent themselves from being eaten by the predator, they'll both end up with being alive in, in both of those cases. And that's because then their genes contain knowledge about the environment that solves the problem of the predator being, being there. Um, so you can see that knowledge has this huge effect on how the branches of the, the universe of the multiverse evolve. Coming back to the ethics part, it seems like part of the reason that there wouldn't be, if I'm following correctly, that there wouldn't be large ethical consequences is because you said that in some cases, the universes could affect each other, like with the experiments that you were talking about, that by, but by and large, the universes are mostly isolated and don't have causal impacts between each other. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so this, this we can't really affect the other branches of the wave function of the, of the multiverse. So there isn't really anything that we can do about the other instances existing. They just exist whether we like it or not. And they, yeah, it doesn't really raise any ethical concerns. Do you think it? Has, sorry, go ahead. Do you think it has any implications for things like free will and determinism? I think free will and determinism are in pretty much the same state that they were in before quantum theory, because quantum quantum theory is a completely deterministic theory of physics. I happen to think that free will and determinism are compatible, some kind of compatibilist. And that uh, you can give a compatibilist accounts of both of free will and both classical and quantum theory. Fascinating. What lends you, what makes you tend towards uh, compatibilism? Well, I think that the thing which we care about in the concept of free will doesn't depend on the world being deterministic or not. I think it's something like we want to be able to. If free will, I think, is roughly about the ability to solve problems that you can find novel solutions, create uh, interesting new ideas that solve problems. And I think that that is completely compatible with determinism in the sense that there can be knowledge that gets uh, created over time. So that's uh, the equations of motion don't forbid it that. Right now, I don't know something in the future, new knowledge will have been created and something novel will have come into existence. So if you, you have this view that a free will is about the ability to create novel ideas, then that, that is compatible with determinism. And I, th I think that's all that we should care about in free will. There is, uh, well, maybe it's not all that we should care about, but it's one of the main things that we should care about, the, the fact that we can solve problems where we can create new ideas. Uh, there's also issues with counterfactuals and whether or not counterfactuals are in fact physical. I, I happen to think that they are physical and that's another way in which determinism is, is compatible with, with free will. Because if you believe that there is such a thing as I could have done otherwise, then even in a deterministic universe, if that makes sense, even in a, sorry, in a deterministic universe, then 
yeah, you can make a case for free will because I, I'm perfectly fine with counterfactuals. I think you can make that case. Hmm. Like something like in this universe, I decided to say something or move in a certain way. And then uh, with that decision, it was sort of determined and that's how the universe worked out from then on. But that there's another universe where I decided not to say that thing or move that way or have that choice or whatever. Yeah, so the, the multiverse does make it more plausible that these that counterfactuals are real because some set of counterfactual statements or things that we thought were counterfactual statements are in fact realized in other universes. So there is another universe in which, I don't know, we, we decided to, as you said, postpone this interview. And that's not just the counterfactual, that is that actually happened in some other universe. Hmm. Hmm. Um, so in that sense, I guess maybe the many worlds interpretation kind of shows that there is such a thing as free will because it makes counterfactuals more, more physical. I have another question I'd like to ask, but it's sort of in a different direction. And before I do, I wonder if there's anything else about uh, the many worlds interpretation or quantum theory that you feel like would be worth adding to the conversation or, or saying more about or explaining in more depth. Um, I don't think I have anything to add at the moment, and I'm curious what, yeah, what your question would be, so mm -hmm. we can go through the other topic. Sure. Um, I guess, so to preface it a little bit, and I, I said this to you in person, but part of the reason I'm interested in this is that the idea of a multiverse has sort of uh, captivated my imagination and my reasoning about the world, and I'd say even even informed my spiritual practice and the way that I go about that. And I, part of the reason I wanted to have this conversation and learn more about it is I wanted to know uh, the extent to which uh, some of those ideas are, you know, real or not, and, um, or, you know, how contemporary science understands them. And um, the sort of, you know, these ideas have made their way into popular culture, and there's lots of films about them or movies or TV shows and things like that. And I wonder what you think about different representations of these ideas that you've seen uh, in stories. Uh, I generally like them. I think it's just fun when, but it, I suppose it depends on the movie, but typically I enjoy the, the representations as a fun bit of science fiction. They're usually false in that the other universes actually affect one another. There's a movie that I haven't seen called Revolving Doors, which I believe doesn't have that feature. It's just two different lives that one person could have been living. So a very minor thing happened that differentiated these two worlds from one another. And that, that's probably more realistic, but generally I'm not too fussed about the realism. I, just, I think it's they're, they're fun stories. Uh, is there anything besides the causal impacts issue that you find is like particularly well or poorly represented? No, I think the causal impact is the main thing that these stories tend to get wrong. Mm -hmm. But other than that, they're, they're, they're perfectly fine. Uh, mm -hmm. pro probably they're still too parochial in that it's only like a couple of other universes that exist in the stories, whereas in, in the real world, it's much more bizarre and there's many, many versions of you. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, I think I think it's typically pretty uh, spot on in how they they represent uh, the theory. Mm -hmm. Again, modulo the causal impact. Mm -hmm. But even you know, I don't I don't care about that too much. It's uh, they're supposed to be stories first, and I, for example, whether or not time travel is possible is, is something I'm not too concerned with when I watch a time travel movie. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's typically nice when the time travel story is at least consistent, where there's some kind of explanation of what's happening during the time travel story and in in the same way it's nice when there's there are consistent rules that govern how these universes interact with one another in stories about uh, multiverses hmm. that that's really my own criteria for what makes it a good, uh, bit of science fiction this is a strange question but uh very complicated sort of reasoning but how to put this Say, say, fast forward 100, 300, 500 years, and 
uh, somehow, you know, in this field, it was determined that actually you could have causal impacts between universes. And mm -hmm. even there were like mechanisms developed for doing that. What would have to be the case for that to be true that isn't currently true? Like, yeah, so, oh, sorry. I, no, please, please. Yeah. Um, so there is a sense in which you can have a causal impact on another universe, but it would have to be pre like you'd have to have, for example, a quantum computer where it's a system which is very isolated from its environment, it's very cold, it's uh, very controlled. And in that kind of a setting, it is possible that the other instances of you, so if, again, if you're a mind running on such a computer, then it's not just the case that your mind can be in a superposition, which in a sense, our, our minds are also in a superposition, they're just saying that we have other counterparts in other universes and we know that they exist. So uh, that would be true of the minds and the quantum computer as well, but it has the additional feature that these other instances can be made to recombine in a particular way. And if you are a mind in such a computer, you could determine through experiment that you, that the other universes that the, and in this case, it doesn't quite make sense to call them other universes because it's really just, the one mind on the computer, which is in a superposition and nothing besides it. It's not, it's not the room necessarily that's in the same superposition because they're kind of, they're not interacting with one another. But regardless of that, the, this mind could feel through experiments that it can perform on the quantum computer that it is in a superposition. And uh, by recombining with itself in, in novel ways, it could determine that. And the experiment is roughly something like it observes uh, a quantum state and then writes down that it observed that state and then it undoes the measurement which is possible in this environment that we're supposing exists, uh, this environment that the quantum computer should allow for. It. And uh, then once it undoes the experiment, it can perform subsequent experiments in which it can determine that it must have been uh, well, basically, it can determine whether or not collapse theory is true, or whether or not collapse theory is true, or that the many worlds interpretation is true. Because in this, in collapse theory, as I said, you, you have to you measure photon in a superposition, and one of the branches, one of the, the instances of the photon just gets erased, and that process isn't reversible. Whereas, according to the many worlds interpretation, both halves are measured. And they, it can be undone, so the, the measurement is reversible in the sense that you can run back the dynamics, and you know, that would be allowed according to the rules of quantum theory. There's some kind of process which allows you to to undo the measurement in a way that isn't possible in collapse theory. And that difference can be observed by a mind running on a quantum computer. That's that's a very that's a full experiment that was thought of by Deutsch in the eighties. And so it could, in some sense, feel that the other universes are there. In that is, it requires a lot of technology that we don't have currently. So we don't have a fully functional quantum computer that has enough bits to, for one thing, simulate a mind. We also don't know how to simulate a mind. So we, that's another problem that you would run into. But in principle, if you would have both of those things, then you could perform this experiment and the mind on the quantum computer could feel that the other universes are there just as much as I can feel that this table uh, is here right now in front of me. Fascinating, fascinating. What is the current state of affairs with quantum computers? Well, we don't have a universal one yet. We have quantum computers, which consist of some, I don't know how many bits at the moment, there's some, I mean, relatively small number of bits compared to what you need to have a fully functional quantum computer, and they can do certain operations. But we're, as far as I know, we're quite far away from having something that is a universal quantum computer in the in the way that you would need it for this experiment. Well, so, what would a universal quantum computer be? Um, it would be a kind of computer which can perform uh, a set of uh, they call them quantum gates, uh, which are, if you combine them, you can make any other quantum gate. 
and I suppose it also it would also need to you would, be, you would need to be able to increase its memory capacity arbitrarily or something like that. You would be able to like extend it by uh, feeding it more memory so that it can perform whatever computation you wanted to perform. But yeah, it's uh I think the main issue is just making sure that these kinds of computers can implement all the, the gates that we want them to implement. And yeah. currently not really able to do that. And besides this experiment that would be very interesting to run, but isn't currently possible, what other kinds of things do people want to do with quantum computers as they develop? I guess one of the main things would be uh, sorting algorithms. So being able to quickly retrieve certain files that would be one thing uh, simulating other quantum systems is something quantum computers can do very efficiently so i suppose that we make chemistry uh, simulations very efficient uh, there is cryptographic procedures which allow you to i think those already exist in some capacity you don't need a full quantum computer for, for forming those but you can uh, You have cryptographic procedures which are far more efficient and reliable and safe. So you, you can't eavesdrop in the same way that you could in classical physics. And that would be another application. And then things like um, there's a quantum speed up. So certain algorithms will will be faster if they're performed. There are certain it's, sorry, it's, that's not quite the right way of putting it. It's that there are certain quantum algorithms. That can do that can solve certain mathematical problems much faster than any classical algorithm could, ever could, and uh, that's another thing that they would probably be used for. Mm -hmm. So factoring prime numbers is possible with Shor's algorithm, or if you run that on a quantum computer, and that is not possible in classical physics. There's no, at least as far as we know, there's no algorithm. Or factoring prime numbers. Uh, it could be possible that one is found. There's no proof against it, its existence, but uh, it's pretty telling that at the moment, at least, there is no classical algorithm, but there is one for uh, a quantum computer. Mm -hmm. At least in principle, there's a theoretical description of what that algorithm, what, what algorithm you would need to run on a classical computer to factorize prime numbers. And what are the sort of constraints or bottlenecks on improving quantum computers at this time? That, yeah, I'm not too sure about the, the experimental side of this. I think it is still just expanding the number of bits, the number of qubits, rather, that you mm -hmm. uh, have on the quantum computer. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, this tendency or proclivity of the qubits or any quantum system to interact with its environment is something that we have to make sure it doesn't happen when you have a quantum computer. And uh, for it to effectively perform the kinds of algorithms we want it to perform. So as I said, like the quantum systems, for them to interfere with the other instances of themselves, they need to be isolated from the environment that they're in. Otherwise, the interference is, is blocked. Hmm. And the larger a system is, the more difficult it is to uh, isolate it sufficiently that it doesn't have any interactions with the environment. So scaling up the number of qubits that you have becomes difficult because the, lot, the more qubits you have, the more the easier it is for something in the environment to, to disrupt them. And then that will ruin everything that's nice about the quantum computer. So that is currently the main issue. Hmm. And zooming out again, I wonder what implications quantum theory has for time and what time is. Ah, yeah. Uh, so this is another topic that we talked about. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I can zoom out even more and return a bit to the pre-Socratics, which I mentioned earlier, where they, uh, so Permenides had this theory that there is no, no change whatsoever. And he came to that conclusion because of his generalization, because he generalized his theory about the moon, he said, the moon looks like it's changing, but it doesn't actually change. There's nothing 
about the moon that's it's not changing its shape it's not uh, doing anything bizarre when it's waxing and waning it's it's just that the light is hitting it differently at different times in the month and so uh, he then proposed that there you know that the the world is like this block universe that there's nothing uh, there's no change at all. all all change is just change that we we uh perceive but if we think about the world sufficiently enough then we will realize that change is just an illusion and uh to some extent that that is, is so his block universe theory is very similar to for one thing general relativity which describes this uh, four-dimensional block in which nothing is changing in the different moments in time are uh, parts of this block and it's it's a nice view partly because there's there's so many issues with how we typically view time so typically time is this thing which we think flows it's not it, instead of the block universe theory the common sense theory of time is the time is flowing that that moments flow into one another but then that raises the question of well if, if time is flowing that yesterday flowed to today did we yesterday is still a fixed date on the calendar it will remain there forever it it, uh, it doesn't really flow to today and saying that time flows will flow implies that there is some change relative to time so with, by saying that time flows are we really just saying that time changes relative to time which is I'm not sure what that would mean even um and in in classical physics there's there's newton's absolute time which uh, of itself and of its own nature flows equitably without regard to anything external that's from the principia basically meaning that regardless of how physical systems behave time is this thing which flows forward uh, at, with, at with equal duration so if you imagine a completely stationary universe then newton would say a universe in which nothing happens like maybe it's an empty universe in which there's there's there are no physical objects that are moving or changing in any way then newton would still say well that there's there's time it's, it's flowing forward as it would if the universe was full of stuff uh, and maybe to dramatize that a bit more you can imagine a universe in which there there are physical systems maybe we can consider our universe in which things are moving and changing and then there's a sudden freeze relative to absolute time where everything stops and is frozen for a period and you can ask well is, does time exist during that freeze because nothing in the universe could register that that freeze is occurring like all the measuring instruments or the clocks that you would need to, to measure the, the freeze are themselves frozen immobilized so nothing in the world could tell that such a freeze has occurred maybe it has occurred right now maybe a million years of absolute time passed by well we were talking uh, I, I often joke that well hopefully it doesn't feel like a million years went by well I was talking because that you know I'm not doing my job very well but yeah, this is a very strange conceptual issue. And the opposite view of this is the idea that time is this, instead of time being this thing which passes by in an absolute sense, there's only relative change. So things can change relative to each other. And this idea that there, and, and that's, in that case, there, there are these gaps, these, these uh, the freeze would not really happen because all there is is, for example, I'm changing relative to the clock. And if both I and the clock are frozen for a period, then that's not really uh, meaningful in this, is, in this relational view. Um, so the, the block universe theories, there's several of them. General relativity is one of them. They all have as a feature that there is no such thing as absolute time. There's just different moments which can exist simulta simultaneously it's, it's, as an abuse of terminology because of course that's implying that there is such a, a thing as time in in this this physical block uh, which describes everything in space and everything in time at, at the, again simultaneously 
And in quantum theory, there's a version of this where the different moments in time are like different universes. So the every moment in time is uh, one of the universes in the multiverse, and we're moving through them. And again, as, as Deutsch, I think, says in the fabric of reality, sometimes people ask what it means or what it feels like to move from one universe to another. And the answer to that is, well, it feels exactly like it does to uh, move to move through time. It's, uh, it's, it's the same experience. We are moving from one universe to another when we are traveling through time. And uh, I think that solves various interesting conceptual issues. So all these issues with Newton's absolute time are completely disappear in these, these blocked universities. And the quantum one is particularly nice because it's a quantum theory of time, which means that uh, by having, yeah, through one of the pillars of modern physics, you're able to give them a physical account of what time is supposed to be. Uh, and so in that sense, the, the many worlds view and the, the modern conceptions of time kind of line up with one another. Hmm. Fascinating, fascinating. We've covered quite a lot of territory. Is there anything else that you'd like to say more about or talk more about? Um, I'm not sure. Well, anything that you want to bring up or discuss is, is still fun. I still have some time. Mm -hmm. uh, but nothing in particular springs to mind at the moment. Excellent. Well, no, I think I think we covered all my questions for today, and you've been very generous with your time and uh, explanatory skills to explain things in a way that I can understand them. So I really appreciate that quite a bit, and I'll be chewing on this conversation for a while. So thank you so much, Sam. Great. Yeah, it was an excellent conversation. Thanks so much for having me. You're very welcome.